Good morning and good to be with you in worship on this Sunday, July 5th. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Comforting words right about now. And I think it's safe to say that at this point that we're all weary of this new normal, if we can call it that, that we're currently living through. We could all use some rest and restoration from the burdens of the past four months and from the uncertainty that lies ahead. And of course, the pandemic isn't the only burden that we carry. Those of daily life were here well before the virus. They haven't gone away. If anything, maybe made worse during this time. And they'll be here well after the pandemic is passed. Many of these burdens are, to some extent, part of being human. The exhaustion, worry, anxiety, and fear that comes with human life, with social life, with nurturing and repairing friendships, searching for relationships, raising a family, caring for our loved ones, all while finding and keeping an employment and always adjusting to our surprisingly fickle health. In this passage from the gospel, according to Matthew today, we encounter a Jesus who has the divine power to offer us relief from these burdens. He does so not by making them go away entirely or by promising us material success if we just plow on through, but rather by walking with us through the trials of life, offering us a peace that the world cannot give, a peace that is finally and fully realized in the coming kingdom of God. This is the yoke that Jesus offers at the very end of our passage for this morning, a metaphor for the wisdom or word of God. If we choose this yoke that Christ offers us over that which the world places on our backs, we will find ourselves relieved of the burdens that the world tries to place upon us, living instead into the abundant joy and peace of God's kingdom. To take up the yoke that Christ offers us is to always remember who we are at our core, beloved children of God created in the divine image, and also to remember whose we are. We belong to God. We are loved by God and we proclaim in faith with the Apostle Paul that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, no power in the sky above or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. To know, to know that the God revealed in Christ is always and everywhere ready to receive those who are weary and carrying heavy burdens is a great comfort, but it's also a challenge. In the Gospels, Jesus identifies burdens beyond the personal challenges that are interwoven with human life. Yes, he restores sight to the blind, heals the lame, and cures the sick. But he also brings good news to the poor, proclaims release to the captives, and sets free the oppressed. The burdens of poverty, captivity, and oppression are not a natural part of life but rather they are a heavy yoke forced upon individuals and entire communities, entire peoples, by those in places of power and privilege. Pharaoh, Pilate, Herod. The Bible reminds the Jewish people that they can bring their burdens to God, yes, but it also holds the powerful and privileged accountable 
for the burdens that they place on others. Think of the ministry of Jesus, his parable about the rich man who refused to even look in the direction of poor Lazarus, who wanted nothing else besides the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers in the temple who were taking advantage of the pious poor. His constant criticism of the scribes and Pharisees for the hypocrisy in teaching God's liberating word while holding on to their power and wealth at the expense of the people. Hear his sharp rebuke of these religious leaders towards the very end of this gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. A converted Pharisee, the Apostle Paul, reminds us what disciples of Christ are to do instead. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ to love one another as Christ loves us. To hear Jesus calling the weary and burdened to his side is also a calling to individual and communal repentance and responsibility. A calling into a deeper and more costly discipleship, to use that phrase from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a costly discipleship that asks when and in what ways have we placed burdens upon our neighbors? not only through our direct actions, but through our participation in groups, communities, cultural systems that allow some to flourish, but not others. When and in what ways have I been unwilling to lift a finger to move these burdens? Where have I neglected to love my neighbor as myself? When I was a kid, I played a lot of baseball up into high school. And throughout that time, there was one insult that I never wanted to hear directed my way. You throw like a girl. Which meant, apparently, that your throw was awkward and weak. That was the intent. Now, I have three sisters, one of whom was a very good softball player. So I quickly learned that to throw like a girl was not the insult that I had been taught. But it didn't really matter. Because the point, of course, was to promote a particular understanding of what it meant to be a boy. One who was athletic, coordinated, and strong. To occupy these categories was to enjoy social prestige or popularity. As well as to benefit from school funds that were directed more towards athletics than, say, robotics. To participate in this name-calling was to burden with shame boys who did not fit this mold, and of course to burden all girls with a very limited stereotype that not only assumed they lacked certain physical traits and abilities, but also assumed that these traits and abilities were ideal or desirable in the first place. Now perhaps you've felt the weight of that particular burden yourself. And if you haven't, you don't have to look very hard to see how it weighs on our neighbors today. Limited and rigid notions of masculinity are used sometimes in very subtle ways. You throw like a girl to disparage compassionate and emotional men, to hinder women with careers and political ambitions and to marginalize LBTQ persons who defy these traditional types. As disciples, we carry each 
others' burdens. We listen even if it makes us uncomfortable. We walk in solidarity even if we do not fully understand. And as we state in our baptismal vows, we resist evil, injustice, in oppression, in whatever forms they present themselves, even if it's a simple phrase, you throw like a girl. The horrific deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd have called our attention once again to another inflicted burden that has never gone away, racial injustice. While we no longer have segregated schools by law anyway, or separate drinking fountains, the sin of racism can be detected in everything from our housing markets to the judicial system. It appears in the guise as something as mundane as a peach-colored band-aid and as life-altering as unequal access to health care, education, and employment. A 2017 study by the Harvard Business School revealed what many of our neighbors already knew from experience. Companies are more than twice as likely to call a minority applicant for interviews if they submitted a whitened resume than those candidates who reveal their race. As the pastor and professor William Gutler writes, the gospel reminds us that rest is not offered to the successful the strongest and the most powerful. Rest is offered to those who have been made weary by a world that fails to comprehend the burden of injustice. Racism, gender stereotypes, and sexism are all complex and uncomfortable topics to discuss, no doubt but too often we willfully get lost in the weeds defending this side or that, forgetting that the Christ we profess always sides with those who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. The great Protestant theologian Karl Barth helps us to see in the scriptures that God always stands unconditionally and passionately on the side of the threatened innocent, the oppressed poor, widows, orphans, and aliens. God stands on this side and on this side alone, against the lofty and on behalf of the lowly, against those who already enjoy right and privilege and on behalf of those who are denied and deprived of it. those of us like myself who enjoy considerable rights and privileges may find this message, this God, unsettling, to say the least. But on this 4th of July weekend, when we celebrate what the Founding Fathers called the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the gospel reminds us that these rights can never be fully realized until they are enjoyed also by our neighbor. The 19th century Jewish poet and activist, Emma Lazarus, put it most memorably, until we are all free, we are none of us free. This is the gospel understanding of life, liberty, and happiness, without which the American dream cannot ever be fully realized. Lazarus seems to have understood as much, defying the gender roles of her day. She composed her most famous poem, drawing upon her Jewish heritage and certainly echoing the teachers of the rabbi Jesus. At a time when the devastating sentence, I can't breathe, rings in our ears and weighs on our hearts, we celebrate with Emma Lazarus, a God who calls out to us, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. 
I lift my lamp beside the golden door. While we Americans continue to strive toward a society that upholds that grand promise, we Christians follow a Christ who always, always welcomes the weary and those carrying heavy burdens to his side. Thanks be to God and amen.